Talk amongst yourselves for a moment. You can finish your conversation now. <laughs> and it's not... Morning, everyone. And welcome to our worship this morning, uh, Sunday the 31st of July. How do we get to the end of July? And uh, But if you're watching us online or you're here... Uh, you know, pray that you'll be blessed by this time. And in the next sort of five, ten minutes, pray that the family who are due to have an infant blessing will be here. So um, let's take a moment to be still. Lord, we come to praise you because you are worthy. We come to give you thanks for you renew our hope. We come to worship you in this place because you walk with us everywhere and every day of our lives. I invite you to stand for our opening couple of songs this morning. First, we're going to open with, To God be the glory, great things he has done. So love to the world that he gave us his son. as we sing, Jesus is King, and I will extol him.
Please be seated. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come to bring you glory and to offer our worship. We praise you for your love which has no beginning and has no end. It was in love that you created the world and because of that love that you came to us in Jesus. We praise and thank you for his living amongst us, his dying and rising again as a sign of your love which knows no boundaries and has no limitations, which fills the whole universe and transforms our lives. We praise you for all that Jesus revealed of you in his life, his words, his actions. He made your love real to us and enabled us to know you as the source of all goodness, truth, and love. We praise you that in him your kingdom came near and that still for us today he remains the way by which we enter it. Lord, give us a sense once more of the value you place on us and our lives. Grant us a sense of joy at the knowledge that by your Spirit you are with us now and in Christ you will be with us always and forever. Help us to be drawn closer to you, loving you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and loving our neighbour as ourselves. Father, we long to follow you to commit ourselves to you. But we confess that we resist the power to make us new. We make commitments to you and one another, but we're weak and we fall. We promise to trust you, to read your scriptures, to make time to pray. But we can so easily fill our time with trivia. We say we'll serve you and love our neighbor as ourselves, but we're deaf to the challenge when it's not convenient. We come with the intention to thank you and praise you, but it must be with songs that we like and words that suit us. Forgive us, Father, for failing to understand the magnitude of your glory and for the way we insult you by our weakness and failures. Touch our hearts and lives by your Holy Spirit that we shall not only be forgiven, but me be made new and clean again. These things we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. There is no wrong that God cannot make right. There is no chasm that can separate us from God's love. The Lord is patient and kind, generous and good. God will not leave you or forsake you. So turn to the Lord with confidence and put your faith in God's great mercy. By the power of Jesus Christ, we are made whole. Amen. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we welcome today Mariana Fernandez de Villa and Antonio Gomez Fajedo, Fajado, along with Carla, their daughter, and Maria, Carla's grandmother, who's been worshiping with us these last few months, but will be returning to Venezuela in the next week or so. Mariana and Antonio have come here to thank God for the gift of their daughter Carla and to, and to pray for God's help in the upbringing of their child. And we as members of this church will promise that there will always be a place for children here. And then we will ask God's blessing on Carla. We will pray for her and for the church's work with children and for children in need throughout the world. So as we prepare to do this, let's take a moment to pray. Living Lord, you are the source of all life. No one is born and no one dies without your knowledge or outside your love. We thank you for the birth of Carla, for her new life and all the potential which rests in her. We also thank you for the love which brought her to life and which continues to surround her today. We know how much she depends on those who care for her how frail and small she is. But we believe that you will give her parents and family and all those who will be involved in her upbringing the wisdom, patience, and skill they need. 
We thank you for all the gifts and talents which will be revealed in Carla as she grows older. And we bring her to you now with all our thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So why do we do this? Why, why do we bless children? Well, it's because it is rooted in the teaching of Jesus and one of the things that we get from Jesus. The, the, the scriptures tell us that people were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And his disciples, they didn't want to know. They spoke sternly to them. And, but when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them. For it is such, to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took the child up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. And so before we begin, I just want to challenge us as a, as a church. Do you, the members and friends of this church, promise that there will always be a place for children here? And that you will play your part in bringing our children to a knowledge of Jesus Christ as their own Lord and Savior. If you will share in that promise, I invite you to stand. I'm going to invite Carla's parents to come forward. And, 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 Mar and Maria as well, please, if you come forward. So Mariana, Fernando, let's just check on this right. Uh, Mariana and Antonio. Sorry. Do you thank God for the gift of Carla? And do you now ask God to help you as parents as you care for her? Do you promise to surround her with goodness, love, and respect? And Maria, will you as Carla's grandma Support Mariana and Antonio as they bring up Carla. And will you promise to surround her with your love? May I? This, this, is the bit that, this is the bit that can always go horribly wrong. But I promise not to drop her. That's a big promise to make. You are one of God's children, and your name is written in the palms of his hand. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and forever. Amen. And Carla, I give you this candle to remind you that Jesus is the light of the world. May you grow in his light and one day not eat it, but uh, one day may you shine for him. And I'll give you these little gifts from the church. There's a couple of Bibles there to, just to, so that she has something of the word of God in her life. Can we just give them all a round of applause? Let's pray. Faithful God, in faith and hope, we entrust to you Carla's future life as it stretches out before her. Protect her in moments of danger. Reassure her in moments of doubt. Strengthen her as she passes from childhood to youth and from youth to life as an adult. Surround her with your love expressed in people who will care for her and give her those with whom that love can be shared. And grant that when understanding comes, she may follow you as her own Lord and Saviour. Amen. Thank you very much.
Carol's going to bring us our Bible readings now. The first reading is taken from Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 18. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in the, their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. The second reading is from Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. I invite you to stand once more as we sing again, this I believe, our Father everlasting, the all-creating one.
Please be seated. Let's pray. Father God, we welcome you by your Holy Spirit into this space this morning. As we gather round your word, we ask that you might reveal to us all we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Do we have volume, Alan? I believe in God, creator the Father of heaven Almighty, and earth, creator of heaven. I believe in Jesus Christ, I his only Son, Jesus our Christ. Lord, his who was conceived Son, by the Holy Spirit, who was conceived and born by the of Holy the Virgin Spirit, Mary, and born of he the suffered Virgin under Mary. Pontius Pilate, he suffered was crucified, under Pontius Pilate, died, and was, was buried, died, died, he descended to buried. hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. I noticed a couple of news stories this week, and they kind of shared a common theme. The first one came in the Conservative Party leadership contest. And Nadine Dorries, the Culture Secretary, compared the two candidates. She praised Liz Truss for traveling around the country in a pair of earrings that she bought from Claire's Accessories for about £4.50 as opposed to Rishi Sunak, who went to Teesside wearing what were apparently a 450 pound pair of loafers and prepared for the debate in a bespoke three and a half thousand pound suit. And the idea that she was trying to get across was to create that, this idea that Liz is like us. She gets us. Whereas Rishi, Rishi, well, he's just the posh rich boy who hasn't a clue about the likes of you and me. And then on the same day, Angela Rayner, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, delivered a speech to the Institute of Public Policy Research, arguing that we need more people from working class backgrounds like hers putting themselves forward for public life. She said, you know, the people who are making the decisions, says, they need to look and sound like us. People need to believe that those making decisions on their behalf understand what's going on in our lives. And in the, last, in the last election, one of the reasons Labour was thought to have lost so many seats up north was because they're perceived to be dominated by London, metropolitan elites and all that sort of stuff. And they say, they don't get you anymore. And I'm not here to debate the rights or wrongs of any of that. But it's not uncommon for our politicians, for example, to go to great lengths to show that they do understand the lives of the ordinary people. They want us to know that they get us, whether we believe them or not. And that's not a new thing. If I were to take you back 2,000 years ago to the first century, Judea and Galilee, you would have the same thing going on there. One of the most famous stories Jesus told was the Good Samaritan. And, uh, but actually, there's, what we don't always realize is that the story of the Good Samaritan was actually a play on an old type of joke. A bit like, you know, we have the Englishman, Irishman, Scotsman jokes. Sort of thing. Well, they had a similar type of thing where they would mock the priest and the Levite for not getting it, and then the hero would come along, and the hero was normally just the ordinary run-of-the-mill Joseph, you know, it's, uh, and uh, what actually made Jesus telling of that story so weird and unique to them was that he was actually taking one of their enemies and making him the real hero in the story. 
But we actually, you know, people put up with the Sanhedrin and they ran the temple. And, but, you know, they weren't actually really held in that high regard. They were seen as the posh boys being a bit too close to and a bit interested in protecting themselves, looking after themselves, than looking after the ordinary people. That they didn't really get or understand the ordinary life of a first century Jew. And a similar argument has crept into theological discussion, not exclusively, but perhaps more so over, say, the last hundred years or so. Uh, it's hard to say whether the suffering of the 20th century was, or the, and the early part of the 21st, is genuinely worse than what's gone before. Because, I mean, for most of history, life has been what Thomas Hobbes would have called, called brutish and short. But the horrors of the trenches of World War I involving what were then considered to be the two most Christian countries on earth. And then follow that up with the Nazi extermination camps or the genocide or attempted genocide witnessed in numerous parts of our world in the last sort of 100 years or so have called people to call into question the existence of God. Certainly the kind of good, loving God that Christians talk about. And one argument for the rise of atheism has been this sense of, I cannot believe in or take seriously a God who stays up there in heaven whilst all this suffering goes on down here. Who's that God to judge us? If God doesn't know what it's like to suffer, he can't know anything about us. And so today we are turning to, as we turn, turn, turn to part of a creed that answers that challenge. We've been spending some time this last few weeks in the Apostles' Creed. It's the oldest, most ecumenical summary of the key parts of the Christian story. And in the last few weeks, we have been particularly looking at Jesus. Never a bad thing to do. And, uh, you know, we considered the first week of that, who Jesus was, that Jesus was the Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. And then last week, we looked at the start of his earthly life, that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. And today, we're turning to the next five words. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. In fact, for the most part, we're actually going to focus on one word, suffered. But before that, I want to get think briefly about the last part, under Pontius Pilate. Why bother in a story about God talking about Pilate? Well, actually, last week we saw that there were two people other than Jesus who are mentioned in the creed. There's Mary and there's Pilate. Mary comes at the beginning of his life. Pilate at the end of his ministry. But there's a key difference between the two. Mary was a nobody from nowhere. In a sense, Mary could have been anyone. It was a common name. To find from scratch the Mary of Nazareth who gave birth to Jesus would be a bit like somebody like trying to date somebody from London and the only piece of information that you had to go on was that their name was John. Whereas Pilate, he's different. Pilate was the procurator of Judea and Samaria between 26 and 36 AD. Jesus was born in the time of Herod the Great and after Herod died, his kingdom was split between his four sons but a couple of years later, Judea and Samaria were just proving too much trouble, and Rome decided they're bringing in direct rule. And Pilate was the fifth person to hold the position of procurator of Judea and Samaria. And the fact that he lasted 10 years suggests he at least had some kind of savvy about him. The thing is, for Pilate, None of us likes really to be remembered by our worst moments, do we? 
and unfortunately that was Pilate's fate. Because the thing that Pilate is probably most remembered for is as the one who ultimately condemns Jesus to death. And the thing is, Pilate, at no stage did he ever doubt Jesus' innocence. He, you know, he kind of says as much several times over. And he had no real respect for the Jewish leaders who brought Jesus to him. You know, he, he saw through them. And he certainly gave no credence to their cries of, we have no king but Caesar. And he's thinking, yeah, right. He did everything he could to avoid having to make the decision he did. He offered them another prisoner, assuming Jesus would be, shown, would be chosen over Barabbas. He then tried sending Jesus to Herod, thinking, well, this Jesus bloke's a Galilean. Let Herod deal with it. Let his own crowd sort this out. But Herod's going, not in your life, mate. And he has Jesus flogged and mocked and in the hopes that, well, that'll settle it. They'll, they'll oppose him. But they cry for him to be crucified. And the thing was, Pilate was the only person who had the authority to take that decision. It was one of the very few things that he was not allowed to delegate to anyone else. And Pilate was in a tricky situation because they threatened him that if he doesn't act about Jesus, he's no friend of Caesar. And Pilate has already found himself in hot water with the people above him, in particular the governor of Samaria, who was his immediate boss. It was mostly because Pilate didn't have the greatest reputation for respecting Jewish customs. And he also had a bit of a reputation for being a bit heavy-handed in putting down rebellions. And a few years after the first Good Friday, Pilate ends up being summoned back to Rome to give an account for his actions, putting down another rebellion. They've just had enough of him. However, Tiberius, the emperor who had called him back to Rome, died when Pilate was on the way. And we don't really know what happened to Pilate because he disappears from history thereafter. But already, by the time that Jesus had appeared before Pilate, the Syrian governor had already sided with the Jewish people in one of the disputes, and Pilate had had to make an embarrassing U-turn. And basically, Pilate knew that if they started pushing this complaint up the chain he was in big trouble and so he did quite literally try to wash his hands of the whole thing but ultimately a significant reason why Pilate had Jesus killed was to save his own career oh Pilate's not alone in rejecting Jesus we will see that but ultimately he will go down in history as the one who gave the go-ahead for Jesus' crucifixion. And we'll return to that thought later. But the inclusion of Pilate, the main reason it says, it enables us to say we are talking about real events involving real people in a real place at a real time. In Jesus, we encounter a God who doesn't stay up in his heaven at a distance. He meets us where we are in time and space. He comes down to our level to raise us up to his. But the key word in this section is suffered. Jesus suffered. Two quick questions. Why does the creed cut straight from Jesus' birth to his death? Like the life in between meant nothing. Or does it? Also, why do we need the word suffered at all? When I come back after a holiday, it'll be, you know, we're going to look at the words, he was crucified, died, and was buried. Is that not enough? You know, we can't tell him he suffered there. Well, actually, the creed does mention his life, but it does it in that one word, suffered. 
By the time the New Testament was written, that word had already become a shorthand way of describing the life of Jesus. We saw it in the first of our Hebrew readings this morning. Jesus is made like us in every way. In particular, he suffered not on the cross, but when he was tempted. So he understands what it's like to be tempted. The most common Old Testament passages that the first followers of Jesus turned to to describe the life of Jesus was one which described Jesus as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Now, you might remember last week when I talked about holding in tension this idea that Jesus is fully God and fully man, that one of the ideas that they were trying to counter was this thing called docetism. It was this idea that Jesus wasn't really fully human. He was just a spirit floating around that looked a bit human. Because, like, I mean, human flesh, that would have limited him. And in particular, they thought it would be wrong to think of God suffering. And the creed says, no, Jesus is fully human. He experienced all of human joy and all of human sorrow. Jesus suffered. And that word suffered, the creed highlights that when God steps into the world in creation, uh, into his creation in Jesus, he's not only fully human, but he doesn't lead some kind of charmed life. He doesn't live in an ivory tower. He's one of the common people. He, he mucks in. He lives our kind of life. He gets the day-to-day struggles we face. And that's something that the Gospels go to great lengths to highlight. Every Christmas we kind of read this op- the opening bits of John and the beginning was the Word. And it says, the Word became flesh. And there's a particular word they use for that. The word is sarks. And there were lots of words that they could have used, but the one that they chose to use highlights the frailness, the vulnerability of the human condition. It's the same word that Paul uses when he talks about the human flesh, the flesh like being weak and sinful. It's about the vulnerability. When God steps into the his, into history in Jesus, he doesn't choose a cushy number. He was born not into a leading family in the empire. No, he's born to a family in the backwater of a people under the empire. When the wise men come, seek the, come seeking a king, where do they go? A palace, because well, that's what you would expect. But he's not there. They find him in an ordinary home in in Bethlehem. When God Almighty comes to us, he comes as a baby, an ordinary baby at that. And yes, this morning we've all gone, oh, look at that. But Carla has has to cry to be fed and changed, doesn't she? Jesus was as utterly reliant on Mary and Joseph to keep him alive as Carla is and her parents today. And he totally relied on Mary and Joseph to keep him safe when Herod tried to have him killed. He couldn't do anything to stop stop that happening. He was a baby. And so far as we know, Jesus doesn't live life as the cream of the crop. When he preaches in Nazareth, People sort of go, hold on a second, where's this guy getting this stuff from? They scoff at him. I mean, we know who he is. We know where he's from. And it's clear he hasn't been to a proper teacher. Most likely, he's been working a normal job. He spends most of his ministry on the road. When somebody asks, can I follow you, Jesus? He says, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. That is not necessarily 
a reference to Jesus being homeless, by the way. The fox was the nickname Jesus uses elsewhere for Herod and his cronies, and the birds of the air most likely refers to Rome, whose symbol was the eagle. Jesus' warning, if you want to come and follow me, this is tough. The world will make room for leaders like Herod and Pilate, but they're not going to clear a pitch for people like Jesus. Good news for the poor is not popular to those who are not poor. It wasn't then, and it isn't now. And he hardly lives a luxurious lifestyle in terms of wealth. He faced hunger and temptation. For the most part, he appears to be dependent on the help of others. On one occasion, when his tax bill comes in, he sends Peter out to cash a, catch a fish, which happens to have a coin in its mouth, and goes, well, there you go, that will be our temple tax. His relationships are strained. His own family think he's out of his mind. Until the resurrection, most of them didn't believe in him. His own disciples misunderstand him continually. They let him down at pretty much every turn. Peter is capable of huge strides forward, but then capable of messing up on the very next breath. One of his best friends stole from him and then handed him over to his enemies. His other close friends turned on him when their brother died. They said, where were you when we needed you? If you could have stopped this, what, what were we up to? Others came for him for what they could get out of him. They took it and then either turned on him when he wouldn't get, be what they wanted him to be or just ignored him. There was one time he healed 10 lepers and only one of them came back to even say thank you. And then there was the religious leaders, the very people who should have got what was going on. They rejected Jesus. They slandered him. They wanted him dead. And what about mental health? Jesus knew anxiety. On the night of his arrest, he was totally overwhelmed, even to the point of death. As he prayed to be delivered what from the head of him, he sweat great drops of blood. He wept by the grave of his friend and over the city that seemed hell-bent on destruction. Ultimately, he was killed in a brutal, humiliating fashion, publicly and painfully. In the eyes of the world, Jesus died abandoned and alone. And there was no other way on Friday evening to spin it. He was a failure. Who could save everybody else but couldn't help himself. So the reason I mention this is because I don't know how you would classify a good life. Health, wealth, success in work, good relationships, freedom from anxiety. I don't know how you'll measure it. But you know what? You would struggle to find a category of good life that most of us would want and say, ha, Jesus had that. And he didn't believe. Sorry, in Jesus we have a God who fully knows what it means to be human. Because when he stepped into history, he suffered. We have a God who gets us. We have a God who is involved in suffering. He takes on the pain and the struggles of the world he created. And he didn't believe that this would be limited to him. He said, if you want to follow me, you'll be treated the same way. If they hate me, they'll hate you. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. To follow Jesus in most of history, in most of the world, has been to sign up for an uncomfortable and ostracized existence. 
It may not be our experience, but we need to appreciate we're the exception. We're not the norm. But when trouble comes, and it will, however it appears, we have a God who gets us. We have a God who understands. When we bring our concern to him, he goes, yeah, me too. Been there. He sympathizes with us because he's taken on frail, vulnerable flesh. He's battled with the daily struggles we face. And we can take this God seriously because he hasn't hidden away in his heaven. He has entered into the madness and the messiness of this world. He understands. He has truly been one of us. In Jesus, we have a God who gets us. But God brought him through it all. And he says, if you trust me, I can do the same for you. Jesus doesn't just understand. He has faced and overcome. He said, in the world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. In a few weeks when I return, we will see just how much he suffered. And we'll see how he overcame. But for now, we remember that God raised Jesus from the dead. Not even death itself was able to keep a hold on Jesus. For God could bring him out and has promised to do the same for us. For all of us. Even for the worst of us. We sang it this morning. The foulest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Really? Do we believe that? Can we claim that for the worst of ourselves? Do we really trust that whatever we bring, we will not have put ourselves beyond the reach of the love of God? As I wrap this up, I want to take you back to Pilate. What happened to him? We really don't know. As I said, he was summoned back to Rome in AD 36, but the Emperor Tiberius died when he was on the way. And there are many traditions. One, for example, in which he develops an obsession with washing his hands but never being able to get them clean. But there's another one. There's another tradition. One found in the Coptic tradition and in the Ethiopian church. In Matthew's Gospel, we read how Pilate's wife interceded on behalf of Jesus with Pilate. She tells him, don't you get involved in this because she has suffered greatly in a dream because of him. And in the Coptic tradition, it is believed that Pilate and his wife, because of that dream and because of what Pilate encountered in Jesus, got curious. And in time, they left it all behind to follow him. They entered into relationship with the risen Christ. They find it incompatible with the life and trappings of Rome. And so, on the 25th of June, in some parts of the world, they celebrate the feast day 
of St. Pilate. I don't know how historical that is. But it is true of what we know of Jesus, that he would forgive even those who took part and were even ultimately responsible for his death and suffering. Because it wasn't just under Pilate that Jesus suffered. It was for Pilate and for each and every one of us that we might know new life and new possibilities. Even the villain can be redeemed. Even Pilate need not be defined in God's eyes by the worst moment. And if there's hope for Pilate, there's hope for us all. For that's the God we encounter in Jesus. Not a God who stands afar off or aloof, but a God who steps into history and into all the messiness and struggles that we face and who comes to us that we might reach him. In Jesus, we have a God who has entered it all and knows us. We have a God who gets us. Grace and peace be with you. Amen. Let's just be still for a moment. Almighty God, you know the struggles of daily life that we face. Nobody gets a smooth ride. We may look around and see other people and say, oh, I wish I had their problems, but they have their problems. They suffer in this world. Help us to know that whatever we bring to you, you are a God who gets us. Help us to know that whatever we bring to you, you don't, define, you don't allow the worst of us to define us. May we know your grace, your peace in our lives. So that when we suffer, we know that we don't walk alone. Amen. We're going to sing a song which we normally only sing at Christmas, but there's no real reason why we should only sing it at Christmas. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown.
Please be seated. Let's pray. And I invite you to share in this prayer as it appears on the screen behind me when I say the words, we look to the cross, I invite you to respond and see your love for us. We look to the cross and see your love for us. So as followers of Jesus Christ, let us pray to our loving Father in heaven. Father, help us all in your church to understand what it really means to love you and serve you. At the times of testing, strengthen us. At unexpected or undeserved suffering, support us. At the end of our energy, revive us. And teach us through it all the inexplicable peace of joy and joy that comes from doing your will. We look to the cross and see your love for us. Father, have mercy on us for the misdirected use of time, money, and resources in this world. In the struggle against evil and sin, empower us so that justice and righteousness are established, upheld and celebrated, and as hearts rejoice in the freedom of all that is good. We pray particularly today for the lands in which Jesus walked, as we remember the BMS work in Israel and Palestine, for those involved in all the various church ministries, those involved in theological training, those seeking peace, those involved in all the humanitarian work to relieve the suffering of this world. We pray for the partners on the ground, and ask, Lord God, that you might be all that they need. And we pray for Embrace the Middle East. And in particular this week for the Fairhaven School in Alexandria, which provides education and training for those with learning disabilities. And we pray for the work that they do in disabled rights activism. We look to the cross and see your love for us. Father, renew our commitment to your loving in all of our relationships, our work and our prayers, in the hard choices give us wisdom, in the painful decisions affirm us, May our words speak your truth, whether that's to encourage, to comfort, or to challenge. We pray for our brothers and sisters at Camrose and for our brothers and sisters at Ryslip. Each of them churches that face their own individual challenges, known to you. We pray for our brothers and sisters at Hatch End and for Lars, their minister, who's still in hospital. We look to the cross and see your love for us. Father, bring healing and wholeness to those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. In the sleepless nights and the endless days of pain, give them the grace to persevere with patience. And may they grow even in the dark times. We continue to remember all in our community who are ill. We especially pray for Cynthia and Rodney and family. We pray for Marjorie. We pray for all those. For Mariana. She undergoes more chemo. For Ruth, who's not with us today. For Anne, for all those who aren't with us for whatever reason. Bring them the healing they need. We look to the cross 
and see your love for us. Father, the full extent of your love for us is greater than we can ever imagine. And in your love and thankfulness, we offer the praise of our lives. Accept our prayers in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Uh, just uh, before I go, just before, because as you, some of you will know, uh, well, most of you will know is that this is my last Sunday with you for a little while. Uh, I'll be off for the month of August this year. And uh, firstly, can I ask that you pray for me? Because uh, it's not just a holiday. I, I, I'm just been, I've realized that the last six months in particular, uh, finally the COVID, the whole closing down and whatever caught up with me a bit. And I'm very, very tired. So... Just pray that it will be a time when I'm blessed and also be a time that sort of I recatch the vision a bit. But before I go, um, Simona, could you get Gabriel to come in? And, and and, uh, and and Ivy and Maria, could I ask you to stand? It's just that I'm kind of conscious. You will see these people for the next, well, some of them for the next few weeks. But I've realized that, you know, I realized last week that this will be the last Sunday that I'm here with because Ivy's going back after her st course is finished. Uh, Simona and Gabriel are moving off to, to the, the giddy heights of Bermondsey and then on to Epsom. And, uh, and, Maria's going back to Venezuela, and it's been lovely, Canada, to have them all with us. And uh, I just want to pray for you before you go. Father God, I do give you thanks for my brothers and sisters that you've brought with us. And we pray, we thank you for all that they've brought to us, in the, even in the short time that they've been with us. And the smiles that they've brought to our faces. And you know, I give you thanks for Gabriella and how you know, I've actually seen her sort of go from just about crawling when she first came here in this very short space of time to running all around the church. And uh, we pray, Lord God, that you will bless them all as they go and, and be with them on the next stages of their journey. May the blessings that we have offered to them, may they go with them and may the blessings they leave with us Stay here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just... And we're going to take up our offering now. Lord God, we give you thanks for all the good things you give us, all the gifts that you bring to our lives. We ask that you might help us to use them well, use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is, May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day.
and I invite you if you to stay for tea and coffee after the service and chat to us longer. And I pray, Father, the Father will go with us in the journey of life and that we may carry the peace of Christ and the power of the Spirit wherever we go. Amen. And come on the lionesses this evening. You've got an English team that I'm actually supporting. Good grief.